excited to have our keynote speaker, um, Director Harold Phillips. He's the director of the Office of National AIDS Policy. Now, in the past, this was kind of more colloquially referred to as the AIDS czar. I'm mentioning that just because some people are more familiar with the term, but um, he is the ONAP director. And uh, my colleague, Michelle Lopez, who's a healthy aging specialist here at GMHC, will be introducing him. And they um, have known each other for a long time. So I'm very excited uh, for her introduction. Take it away, Michelle. Yes, and good afternoon. And thank you, everyone who is joining us here. Harold, it's so great to see you. I have to start off my introduction the way that I'm going to right now. I met this warm and kind-hearted gentleman in 1995. And this was when women were being diagnosed with HIV and AIDS. And we were very lost in the healthcare systems across the country. Harold was a staff then at NMAC. He was the director of technical assistance. Believe it or not, he wanted to hear about the issues that women of color were experiencing. I kept my eyes on the prize. In 2012, he became the deputy director of state HIV and AIDS programs, and he was still interested to learn and understand the challenges affecting communities of color, including women and children. He has a master's in regional planning and community de development from the University of North Carolina. His BA in political science and government has been utilized and he makes a difference in the lives of all that he serves. When Harold moved on to be the director of the Division of Training and Capacity Development at HHS, <laughs> we ran into each other at one of our annual conferences. This is where we reunite with friends and many of our colleagues working in AIDS. Harold looked at me and he said, Michelle, I am so proud of the work you are doing. He acknowledges one, not for who you are, but how you make him and his community feel. I have the lived experience throughout the years of seeing and knowing Mr. Harold Phillips. He has been diligent. He continues to fulfill his life purpose by being appointed now as the AIDS SAR. It is my honor to introduce you to my friend, Director Harold Phillips. Thank you, Harold, take it away. God bless you. Thank you, Michelle. I, you know, you make me cry uh, with that introduction. Um, so uh, thank you. Uh, so very much while I try to pull myself together. I wasn't, I wasn't ready for that at all. Um, thank you. Uh, and I'm very honored to be here with you all today. Um, and that fantastic uh, introduction um, that I think does definitely sum up uh, both my approach to the work, my interest in the work, um, and uh, uh, that everything that I've uh, tried to do, as well as take those lessons learned uh, by sitting and listening and learning. Uh, I was recently asked the question of, let's see if I can do this. Yes. Uh, the question of what came first for me, my policy experience, or was it um, hearing or involving the community? And I think it's that background of an urban planner that really and truly put me in a space where I needed to listen, I needed to learn, and I still continue to try and do that. Um, I also want to thank, before I get started in the presentation, uh, Meredith as being both facilitator and working on logistics, and also Dr. Karpiak and all of those at GMHC and ACREA who 
continue to lift up these issues and ensure that there is an adequate federal response to the needs of those living and aging with HIV. I think you all probably know that September is Healthy Aging Month. Um, can you see my slides? I'm doing it. I'm yes, doing the can. thing. Okay, great. So I think you all know that September is Healthy Aging Month, uh, which helps focus our national attention on uh, the health and well being of older adults. And so it's fitting that in September, we also annually observe National HIV AIDS and Aging Awareness Month, uh, especially with our day on the 18th. Uh, bringing attention to both the growing number of people living long and healthy lives with HIV and their health and social needs, and also the work that we need to continue to do to reduce stigma and promote prevention, testing, treatment among older adults. As Michelle said and, and talked about uh, my long history here, uh, uh, I'm both someone who is over 50 and living with HIV, and I'm glad to be marking both observances. And I'm happy to have you all joining in as well um, as older adults living with HIV, many of you working in not only living with, but also working in some capacity and providing services and also the advocacy work. I am uh, extremely honored to be following the extremely talented and gifted Melanie Reese, who um, if you had a chance, if you didn't have a chance to catch our presentation, please catch it on, on, the, re on the rewind or uh, recorded. Uh, she, as usual, was fantastic, both inspirational and informative. And Melanie, I did, it did not go by me when you mentioned that you no longer have sex from the chandeliers uh, at your age. I caught that. And I was like, she continues to inspire all of us. Um, and uh, just a, a fan. So it's great to see you. I wish we were definitely in person. Um, I think, um, you know, in little more than three months, I've been in this position uh, with the White House. And it has truly been um, so far an honor to represent you all to also work to better understand some of the issues that we need to include in the new national HIV strategy, and also thinking about what policy levers we need to pull in order to get to different results. You know, I think it's no not wasted on any of you all that those who are age 55 or older living with HIV in the United States has continued to increase. Um, 18, over 18,000 are undiagnosed and living with HIV and over 50. So we still got some work to do. And I think as some, as Melanie pointed out, some of that is related to both HIV stigma as well as HIV criminalization, uh, and also things that we want to address uh, as part of the national strategy. Over half of those with diagnosed HIV uh, aged over 50 or older in 2018, as illustrated by the CDC graphic. Also, this slide represents estimated HIV incidents uh, among persons 13 years of age and older by age in the U.S. from 2010 to 2019. The number of infections between 2010 and 2019 remained stable among those persons age 55 and older and account for the smallest percentage of the new HIV uh, diagnosis. We also know that one in six new HIV diagnoses in 2018 were among those age 50 and older. That means that among the 37,968 new diagnoses in 2018, 17% were among people age 50 and older. And most of those diagnoses were among men who reported male-to-male -male sex, sexual contact as their primary factor. And however, 1,815 diagnoses were among women over 50. So we still have so much to do with uh, in this group. I think as we sort of see our baby boomers older age, they're continuing to engage in behaviors that put them at risk. So when we think about sort of prevention for this group. We also need to think about appropriate messages and also 
that many may see themselves as not being at risk. They are not inspired by folks like uh, Melanie, who might not be swinging from the chandeliers, but you all also heard her say she's not exactly swinging from the chandeliers. But, you know, this population, how we reach them, when we reach them, and making sure that our messages are appropriate as well, because there still is risk as this data shows. I'm encouraged by the data we have on outcomes along our HIV care continuum for older adults. And this slide represents presents CDC's prevalence based on the HIV care continuum for, for 2018 for persons living with diagnosed or undiagnosed HIV in the United States by age. And for those that are 55 years and older living with HIV in the United States, you see the four columns on the far right next to the yellow arrow 95.4% have received a diagnosis, 71.3% received HIV medical care in 2018, 56.8% are receiving continuous care, and 64.2% had viral suppression. Now, many of you might be familiar with the Ryan White data, which shows even greater viral suppression and shows greater viral suppression among those Ryan White clients that are over 50. But what this shows us is that nationally, when we take the group as a whole, that there is still some lagging behind when it comes to uh, viral suppression. Although our group that's over 50 had the highest percentages in any age group, this, this still signals that improvements are needed, particularly with regard to retention in care and viral suppression. And I'll talk more about this because you also have heard Melanie talk about quality of life issues which get in the way of, of maintaining, staying in treatment, and also achieving viral suppression. And so what are we going to do about that? So I'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. So overall, I think this data presents uh, a positive light as we sort of look at those who are over 50. But I think what it also shows is that we still definitely have some challenges. Um, you know, older people in the United States are more likely than younger people to have late stage HIV infection at the time of diagnosis. And I think as, as Mark talked about in his presentation, there's a challenge with the later that you get into care. And so really I think making sure that we have, uh, that not only do we target those and, and think about services for those who are 50 and diagnosed, but also those who might not be diagnosed as well. We still have some work to do. Um, because often with older adults, we don't talk about sexual health. We don't talk about drug use behaviors. And we need to be able to ensure that our healthcare providers are asking those questions, assessing risk. And then we also do work on the front end for those uh, going and seeing their doctor. Often this might be due to an embarrassment to discuss sex, or they may mistake HIV symptoms for just what we might call normal aging. As a result, they're not getting HIV tests. Um, and like I said, there are at least 18,800 people over 50 estimated with undiagnosed HIV. In addition, this issue of late stage HIV infection at the time of diagnosis um, and starting treatment late, I think Stephen had some really great points about that and why we need to do a better job at early diagnosis and entry to care for those who are living with HIV. 50% um, who've had HIV uh, for 4.5 years before they were diagnosed are part of that sort of characteristic of those who are over 50. Some of this also is due to stigma, uh, which is common among adults with HIV and neg negatively impacts quality of life self-image and some of those other behaviors. And so people age 50 and older may also need assistance in disclosing their status to others, family and friends. Not disclosing can lead to isolation um, due to illness, loss of family, friends, and community support. So really, I think working to understand some of, the, some of these different characteristics and some of these challenges is also part of our work as we look at uh, how to move forward. I think uh, also what not to be um, 
Also of consideration, is there increased risk for cardiovascular disease, lung disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, bone loss, and certain cancers, uh, and the need to also do some additional research on the intersection of these issues as well. I'd like to talk about some, just briefly, some of the federal activities on HIV and aging that we are engaging in that I think will, will be helpful as we figure out how we move forward uh, and some of the work that the federal partners are doing. I may mention of the Ryan White program, um, and I think that you'll see um, some additional shifts in both the Ryan White data around those who are over 50. Um, and as you can see in this slide over a decade between 2010 and 2019, there's a noticeable shift in the age demographic of the clients served by the Ryan White program. Um, clients age 65 and older accounted for 25.9% of the clients age 55 and older in 2019. And this shift is attributable to many things. Um, not the least is the effectiveness of HIV treatment today. And people who with HIV who are on treatment are living longer and healthier lives. Um, I think also when we look at uh, viral suppression, um, we see reflected in this slide, the oldest group of Ryan White clients that have had consistently highest, the highest viral suppression rates over the past decade. And those rates have steadily improved over time. It's our over 50 group. Um, so again, sort of thinking about treatment, I think those who are receiving Ryan White services uh, do better. And I think that part of that is also the comprehensive nature of the Ryan White service delivery system, where not only are you getting sort of the medical care, but the wraparound or support services that also assist. And those also assist with dealing with some of the, some of the things like the barriers that get in the way, whether it be food or housing or transportation, also mental health services, behavioral health, Ryan White support groups also help in this. I think all of those are configured in a way when you've got a great case manager who can help you get that access that you need to those other services that help keep you in treatment. Many, uh, you know, as Melanie was talking today, one of the things that I really thought about is the fact that People li living with HIV have led the way for reforms in our overall health system throughout American history. And I think that those living over 50 will continue to push for us to reform and change our systems so that we not only think about sort of medication and medication adherence, but also quality of life issues as well. HAB is also really, I think, uh, thinking about these issues uh, and taking have had some technical expert panels on the issue and really looking at what else needs to be done to reconfigure the Ryan White or modernize the Ryan White system so that it can meet the needs of those that are over 50. And here on the screen are just a couple of examples of some of the things that they have been doing and thinking about uh, as part of these panels. Not only HAB and HRSA, but also the work of NIH uh, and some of their strategic plan, which is also incorporating research that looks not only at reducing incidence of HIV, next generation HIV treatments, the cure, but also the associated comorbidities and co-infections. Um, and Dr. Maureen Goodnow, the NIH director for the Office of AIDS Research, has talked about how much of their research in looking at comorbidities, co-infections, and complications this also includes research related to HIV and aging as a priority for NIH and the HIV research agenda. I also um, just highlight some of the work that the Department of Veterans Affairs is doing around HIV care. In 2018, VA reported that over 43% of all veterans in care tested for HIV, part of their effort to make screening more routine, um, and they're also doing work to ensure that there's access to and utilization of PrEP across its system. And for veterans with HIV in care, the VA viral suppression rate is also extremely high. Um, they have been also doing a cohort study on veterans aging with HIV. 
uh, or an aid veterans aging cohort study, uh, which continues to inform some of their advances as well. Um, one of the things that they have been doing is working on identifying and addressing co-infections and comorbidities experienced by people with HIV as they age. The study started in 1997 and now involves over 40,000 veterans. And much of that data comes from their analysis of electronic health records. At the end of each year, the cohort gets updated to include veterans with new diagnosis of HIV infection and matched controls sort of receiving care within the, the same fiscal year. So they also are part of the plan to end HIV and have been uh, also good federal partners in working across the veterans health systems to ensure HIV testing, PrEP, and also uh, high quality HIV care. Moving beyond uh, HIV care, I just wanna talk about and highlight some of the work that um, HHS's Administration on Community Living, um, they're one of the components of the Administration on Aging. And for those of you who are not familiar with this human services agency, it's charged with carrying out the provisions of the Older Americans Act, um, and that act helps promote the well-being of older individuals by providing services and programs designed to help them live independently in their homes and communities. Um, the act also empowers the federal government to distribute funds to the states for supportive services for individuals over the age of 60. Their work supports a network and community-based organizations in all 50 states and Washington, D.C. to support older adults. Uh, and this includes aging and disability resource centers, area agencies on aging, senior centers, and supportive services for older adults. The HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau has been working with them over the past year to identify opportunities to collaborate together and improve community-based aging services for people with HIV and enhance sort of a competencies and understanding of the need for services for people living with HIV. Um, ACL recently issued new guidance on state plans to state directors of aging services that applies to any new plan taking effect after October 1st, 2020, 2022, sorry. And that guidance encourages area agencies on aging to take a broad approach to ensuring services are reaching older adults in the greatest social needs in line with the, so, with the executive orders by President Biden so the specific guidance names, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer persons, among other populations. The Agency on Aging also has a national TA center aimed at improving quality of life and services and for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender older adults. So I encourage you to visit their website. They offer a variety of resources that could be useful in the work to inform service providers or policymakers in your community. That same guidance for the first time also asked states to include in their state plans a description of plans and inclusion of objectives and measures the state will use to demonstrate progress towards serving older adults living with HIV. And so we're pretty happy about the fact that now we're getting more visibility, awareness, and inclusion in these plans to improve on the local level services for our aging communities as well. So it's really promising development uh, and working with uh, the Agency on Aging. So the National HIV Strategy and updating it has been a, a huge part of my work uh, over the last couple of months. And we are working to get a new plan released uh, in by World AIDS Day. And I just wanna do a quick review of some of the activities. Uh, Melanie talked about um, the more recent document, she called the Denver Principles Part Two, uh, which I love, uh, and some of the input that we have been getting to modify the National HIV AIDS Strategy that was released in January under the previous administration. One of the most important things that we're doing is modifying it to reflect this administration's priorities, using also the most recent data and research findings getting additional engagement from other federal departments and programs, and also having uh, getting input from uh, the community, including uh, the people with HIV networks, as well as one of those, the Southern AIDS Coalition, the Federal AIDS Partnership, 
Uh, lots of others have also submitted comments uh, and things for consideration as well. So uh, as we continue to move all of this forward, I think I'll say a couple of other just brief things about the plan and what we know. We're still in the process of analyzing the feedback that we have and thinking about new directions in the plan, as well as this administration's priorities. While everything isn't finalized, I think a couple of things, uh, especially based on some of the things that Melanie talked about that we need to work on at the federal level, but also the state level. Um, quality of life, I think you will, you will hear and see more about quality of life for people living with HIV as part of this plan. Also, more in terms of aging and ways that we sort of build and create additional partnerships to assist and meet the needs of those that are aging with HIV. The issue of HIV criminalization uh, and how we tackle that not only on the federal level, but also on the state and local level. Racism as a public health threat and the need to address racism within systemic racism within our systems and structures. Also, stigma and discrimination. Um, talking about not only the work that HHS is doing across the board, but also additional work that we need our private sector partners to do when it comes to stigma and discrimination. We've learned a lot about the issue of medical mistrust, not only from our HIV work, but also as we go through COVID-19. And not only medical mistrust, which is sometimes rooted in uh, racism and systemic racism in particular, but also the issue of medical misinformation. Uh, and how social media and medical information spread at a much faster rate than it used to be from the guys on the corner who would, you know, in my neighborhood, share a lot of medical misinformation. Now we have social media where it start share is shared faster, quicker, uh, and more efficiently. Um, I'm also, as I revise the plan and I also talk with the community, I am so happy that Melanie talked about the need for state and local action. I think we are learning through COVID-19 in a very big and visible way, the limitations of what the federal government can do. A lot of our activism and a lot of our understanding also needs to take place at the state and local level. When I think about things like HIV criminalization, we will be using the power of the White House and the federal government to see what we can do to address it on the federal level. But a lot of these laws are state and local laws. And so in so doing, we need partnerships across to be able to address some of these issues in particular. We need action at the state and local levels that will be essential. And this includes training and expanding our capacity of providers for both healthcare and social services, developing new models that integrate care and support and combat, combat the various stigmas, including ageism that affect HIV outcomes for older adults. So we've got to work with our legislative bodies as well as our health departments, our service providers, our providers of professional education, our planning councils and our other stakeholders. Some might not be accustomed to working on HIV issues given the demographic shifts, but we can all be advocates for their encouragement and engagement. And we can all be useful assets to successful participation in these efforts. I look forward to continuing to work with you in this capacity um, and looking at ways to address the in, these intersecting issues. So thank you. Well, I do have some questions for you, Harold. Some very, you know, a lot of the questions that I'm seeing here, um, I know we have up until 1.50, so I'm gonna pose some of them uh, to you. Okay, I thought I heard someone saying something. So one of the questions, and you 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 skirted to it, you mentioned it, but one of the questions is how can we expand the national HIV strategy from its present focus largely on biomedical prevention, instead to have a strategic plan that also addresses the quality of life for older persons living with HIV and AIDS. Yeah. So, and I think you addressed it in one aspect, mm -hmm. but I want to be fair to this person that asked the question, you know, pose it to you if you can expand. Sure, I, I, I love the question and it is uh, definitely one that we are uh, looking at very carefully. 
So one of the things that we are considering is whether or not to add older persons living with HIV over 50 as a priority population. In order to do that, I need to make sure that we have good surveillance within sort of our reporting mechanisms from state to CDC to be able to track our progress on. Now, one of the things that shows up for us in considering older Americans living with HIV is that previously, one of the factors that qualified groups as priority populations were, was the viral suppression rate. People over 50, as you saw in my slides, do really well in, in taking their medication, but that's not the whole story. And so one of the things that we are doing is looking at how can we, what indicators and what data do we have on a national level to be able to track and measure improvements in quality of life for people living with HIV and especially those over 50. And so when we think about quality of life, there's so many different things that sort of flow into it. You know, my mental, my behavioral health, my sexual health, um, my economic health, uh, my stable housing. And so we're going to call together our federal indicators work group to look at all these issues and figure out what's the best way to incorporate it into the strategy. And then also, what are the national data sets that we have to be able to measure it? Because we could put words in the strategy, but if I can't hold anybody accountable using data, then those words are meaningless. So we really are taking a close look at what data sets we have. But I think you'll see and hear more about this in the strategy as well, and also in the coming months. Okay, we do have another question. So what is being done uh, from the Y and Right programs, right, to impact Medicare and Medicaid programs, again, that is serving you know, the person aging, you know, older persons with HIV and AIDS. We are going to have to look at some new needs. Our right. needs have changed. Right. And I think one of, some of the things that we look forward to doing and working on next year, um, this administration has worked to uh, expand uh, access to Medicaid and Medicaid services. Uh, I think it's uh, a great deal, many of people living with HIV receive, also receive services through Medicaid. One of the challenges with Medicaid is that it is, excuse me, that it is both a state and a federal partnership. And so some of the changes in Medicaid take place at the state level. And again, I think like Melanie talked about, sort of advocacy at the state level is really important. Many states have adopted some of the quality measures, uh, the HIV quality measures, and have been able to increase some of the HIV related outcomes. We'll continue to push that as part of the partnership and the work with Medicaid. I think when it comes to Medicare, we are also uh, working closely with Medicare, uh, especially around some of the, the issues of aging and looking at some of the quality of life pieces. I also think that our partners from HRSA and HAB have uh, had some, like I mentioned, some technical expert panels and are looking at some of those best practices as well and ways to also incorporate and also train our providers on some of these issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have uh, one other question is the ACL, um, are they including, are they having discussions, getting input, you know, from organizations such as AARP, um, someone have stated they have been working um, with their uh, Pennsylvania State and AARP on advocacy issues. So we are looking at the different entities that already is in existence serving the aging population. How are they being prepared or impacting the, you know, integrating this nuance of aging adults, aging with a virus? So I, I, I love this question. Um, I, I would say a couple of things. We are, and I'm glad you mentioned AARP. Um, I think one of the things that we have to do is make organizations like AARP aware of these issues and their needs, uh, and the needs of people living with HIV that are over 50 and how we 
can, how both we need to be part of the planning and part of the service delivery and the unique needs. One of the things that we're looking forward to doing after I get the strategy done uh, and uh, in early 2022 is having a meeting with private industry, bring them all together to talk about these things. And I'm glad you mentioned AARP so that I can put them on the list. We can't just uh, achieve the goals of the national HIV strategy with just state and local governments. Private sector partners, are we want them at the table as well and engaged to understand the issues, but to also help us because they have inroads and, and skills and expertise that we don't necessarily have. And I think AARP um, is one of those organizations that, because I get the magazine now, um, that is helpful in helping me think about other things outside of just taking my medications. Uh, it's about discounts and making my money go farther, things that I can do to, to you know, incorporate walking and exercise into my life. And so I think these new partnerships that we want to look and, and create are going to be really helpful. Uh, I know that it's 10 to 2. We have like three, I think, more questions in the queue. Um, do we want to just do those and then take a break? Yeah. I'm going to ask him, yes. This here is a very key question. Uh, can you support integrating geriatric care into Ryan White clinics as have been done by UCSF? the Compass um, HIV Geriatric Clinic. So we have some best practices going on, but it's not being acknowledged, it's not being recognized, you know? And I wanna also to uh, add on to that question, can we look forward to the directives of having states develop new quality of care indicators addressing the need to have gerontology care and services integrated as part of our standard of care when we reach the age 50. That should be an indication that it was done. So I, I think that's, a, that's an awesome question, as usual, Michelle, and, and whoever asked it uh, in Michelle the chat. Michelle from Jules Levin. Ah, from Jules. So Jules, I know that uh, Hersa Hab is looking at some of these issues and part of the technical expert panel. I will say that in looking at them, I think Ryan White currently has the flexibility to be able to incorporate some of these services into its service model. I think the other thing to look at, because while we don't have uh, national standards for those that are living with HIV, we do have the treatment guidelines. And so one of the things that your question raises for me is whether or not the treatment guidelines committee is doing any additional work to take a look at these issues, uh, especially when it comes to gerontology. And I think if they are able to look at that, so I'm, I might have to write this one down so I can track all three of these levels that you've asked this one question. So <laughs> is, is the committee that formulates our treatment guidelines, are they looking at additional changes that would incorporate gerontology as uh, so much so as we have a number of folks getting to that over 50 piece is how what else is hab looking at in terms of being able to integrate this into ryan white care and treatment and then what i do know is that as we are developing a quality of life indicator as part of the national strategy once we put it in as an indicator it may get picked up in other places like you mentioned michelle um because what in in including an indicator in the national strategy. And we have to think about what data sets we have that would help us. Um, and also the thing that I am committed to doing is after we figure out what data sets we have and what we think is important from the federal level, being able to bring it back to people living with HIV and saying, here's what our data set says, here are the elements of quality of life because there are so many that we feel like we can incorporate and does this at least get us closer to where we hope to be. Great, great. Looking forward, looking forward to that work. And I can say again, here at GMAC, we do have collected data. We have one of the main researchers from the raw studies, Dr. Stephen Carfax. So there has been some preliminary findings 
that has already been indicated in some of these research and focus groups. And we just need to supply you with them, Harold. And I know we will do a great job doing that together. Okay. Thank you. So you're looking forward. I'm going to um, close off with the questions. Um, I did not see any other specifics. If I've missed it, I'm very sorry. I apologize. But we have you know, some other presentations to delve into. And I'm anxiously waiting them. So thank you again, Harold. Thank you. And I look forward to our continued work together, my dear. Thank you, Michelle. You're thank so you, everyone. Welcome. Thanks so much, Director Phillips and Michelle for such a uh, wonderful conversation. Uh, we're just gonna take a break um, until two o'clock, a short break, and then we will have our panel of advocates. So please um, take a moment to stretch or grab some water, whatever you need, and we will begin our panel at two. Okay, everyone. Right.